Good morning. Good to see each of you here this morning. So glad that y'all are here. Uh, one of the great things about our local conference and those kinds of things is that I get to see some folks I haven't seen in a while. Like my good friends Aaron and Corey. Man, it's great to have them here. Uh, glad that you guys uh, could come in and be with us this morning. What, what a pleasure, what a joy that is. Uh, and it's good to see each of you here this morning. Even if I see you every week, even if I see you multiple times a week, it's still good to see each of you here this morning. We turn our attention this morning, our, our prelude was on eagle's wings, which brings to mind Isaiah chapter 40, starting in verse 21. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted. Scarcely shall they be, shown, shall they be sown. Scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth, when he will also blow on them, and they will wither. And the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name. By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob? And speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God. Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary. The young men shall utterly fall, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let's pray. Father, throughout this week, I don't know how you've impressed yourself into the minds of others who are here this morning, but throughout this week, one word you've been bringing to my mind over and over again, faithfulness. Father, not my faithfulness, never, but Father, you always prove yourself to be the faithful one. We see through the pen of the prophet here, through, through what you have, have breathed into the mind of Isaiah, we see here that the things in this world seem to grow up and pass away, and that the only thing that's left at the end is you. We are reminded, Lord God, that that everything in this world, everything in this, in this lower reality, in this reality that we know by the senses, everything, Lord God, will eventually pass away. We know that. It's just the way of things. But we also know, Lord God, that you will always be. You have always been. You will always be. But more than that, you are present with us now. Father, great is your faithfulness. Thank you for meeting with us this morning. Thank you, Father, for what you desire to do in this place today. May your will be done in all things. Amen. We have a few announcements before we get going any further in our service. We have a few announcements we want to bring to your attention. Uh, this morning, of course, we have our local annual conference today. Uh, that's following our service and following the meal that we're going to share together. Uh, all are invited, um, and I, I'm so glad that so many of you are able to be here this morning. Uh, we do have, of course, uh, before Sunday, uh, before our Sunday morning time, we do have our children Sunday school, and of course now we've started for the last month or so, our, our adult uh, gathering is back in, uh, in full swing. Uh, Bill was kind of under the weather this morning, and so uh, he turned it over to me. That'll probably be the last time that he lets that happen, but... Uh, um, there you go. But we, uh, we have a great time in there, good time together. Uh, we get to, uh, to, to 
talk about things that are going on, but more importantly, we get to talk about all the ways that God is at work and that God is continuing to, uh, uh, to direct us and to make himself real in each of our lives. I encourage you, if you have an opportunity to come early on a Sunday morning and to, uh, and to come to the adult uh, group, you do so. Uh, Trail Life American Heritage Girls are, are still uh, the primary means of our children's ministry to our community. Uh, both of those groups are active today, but both of them will be away from here today. So uh, we have the, the Trail Life boys uh, going over and doing a hit the trail where they're doing something out in the community, and then the, the girls are actually meeting. It's a beautiful day, so they decided they're going to meet down at the park today and enjoy, and enjoy the outdoors. So continue to pray for both of those groups and the leaders of both of those groups. Uh, Classical Conversations is still in full swing right now. It's our, uh, our homeschool group. Uh, they are meeting here each Monday, and we are so grateful to be that place where uh, the homeschool community is, uh, is, it has a place to meet here in the Robinson area. Uh, discipleship Study, Wednesdays at 7 p.m., right back over here in the, again in the Fellowship Hall area. Uh, men's Prayer Breakfast is coming up. That's this coming Saturday at 7.30 a.m. Uh, men of the Church, I encourage you, I invite you, if you can make it Saturday morning, 7.30 uh, we'll be over here, as far as I know, unless something changes. And if anything changes, I'll let you know before Saturday morning. But we'll just plan on meeting over here Saturday morning at 7.30. Uh, Board of Stewards uh, meets uh, February the 13th, so that meeting is right around the corner as well. And uh, I'm so thankful for, uh, for all the ways that our Board of Stewards has uh, stepped up and continues to step up to uh, direct the different ministries and direct the different groups that are involved in ministry here at our local church. I'm being told, the first I've seen this, first I've heard of this, uh, Linda's recital has been rescheduled for February the 27th at 7 p.m., right? Hey, look at that. <clears throat> Roxy Grove Hall, and uh, we look forward to supporting her on February the 27th. I have no doubt more information about that is going to come out in the uh, couple of weeks ahead, so we look forward to doing that. As, off, as always, as we always say, uh, check out what's going on uh, in, uh, in the other Bethel Methodist churches. Uh, you can even, if you want to, you can even look at this guy's sermons online. I don't know why you do that. Well, yeah, you watch him more than you watch me, that's for sure. But um, BethelMethodist.com slash Robinson is where we are. You can also see what's going on in the other Bethel Methodist churches, and I uh, invite you and encourage you to keep, uh, keep a tab on what's happening there. We have, for the last... Uh, uh, I, I hesitate to say how long. We have gotten into the habit now of having our offering basket at the back of the sanctuary. And uh, again, as we say every week, thank you so much for your faithful giving. But more, so much more than your faithful giving, thank you so much to God for his faithfulness and for his continued provision for each in each of our lives. One of the things that our offering goes to support is, uh, is of course, our involvement with the, the local food pantry. John sent me numbers yesterday from the food pantry, and uh, they are right where they have been for the last few months. Uh, 333 total households were fed through the food pantry yesterday. Uh, that accounts to 1,328 individuals, and of that, that's 28 new households and 72 new individuals. First time that they've ever been to the food pantry, 72 new folks yesterday. So again, that food pantry continues to be a blessing for folks in this area and beyond. And uh, part of that happens because of uh, the way that God continues to use this local church and all of the ways that God uh, blesses those ministries uh, through the giving of this local church. So since we are thankful to God this morning, we're going to stand and, and uh, turn our attention away from from announcements and away from me and onto God, we're going to stand and sing the doxology together. Let's stand. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above. you to have a seat for, for our first song. We're going to read a psalm this morning and uh, add that to our scriptures because it's a song, a psalm that 
tells us to sing, and that's what we intend to do this morning. Psalm is 147. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing the praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and praise is beautiful. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He counts the number of the stars. He calls them all by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked down to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praises on the harp to our God, who covers the heavens with clouds, who prepares rain for the earth, who makes grass to grow on the mountains. He gives to the beast its food, and to the young ravens that cry. He does not delight in the strength of the horse. He takes no pleasure in the legs of a man. He, the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his mercy. Praise the Lord. We're going to sing this morning one of Charles Wesley's hymns, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King. The triumphs of His grace Jesus, the name that charms our fears That bids our sorrows cease Tis music in the sinner's ears Tis life and health and peace He breaks the power of cancelled sin He sets the prisoner free his blood can make the phallus clean, His blood availed for me. My gracious Maker and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad, the Let's stand together as we hear the gospel reading this morning from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 29 through 39. If I can get my pages apart, I'll read it with you this morning. Now, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, Let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for the purpose, for that purpose, and he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. Let's sing together familiar hymn, Sweet Hour of Prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, that calls me from the world of care, and bids me at my Father's Just spirits burn with strong desire. 
desires for thy return. With such I hasten to the place where God my Savior shows his face and gladly take my station there and wait. together our confession of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is sitting at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and from there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father. I have to tell you this morning, I uh, asked Jack, I said, do you, uh, you're, you're home for this weekend, do you want to run the slides and do the sound and give John a break since he's been doing it so much lately? Uh, he said, sure, I'll do that. Now I think he's regretting that. I don't know what's going on with this speaker over here, but whatever it is, we need to, can, do we cast, do we cast demons out of speakers? Can we, can we do that? I, I don't know, Absolutely. Uh, we do have, uh, this morning as we go to prayer, we have uh, a few things that I want to bring to your attention. Uh, we've had a number of folks who have uh, who've been sick over the last uh, couple of weeks. We've been praying for them. Uh, one of those is our good friend Carolyn. Uh, Carolyn has uh, been released from the hospital finally. She's in the hospital for uh, more than a week. So she's out of the hospital. Uh, she has gone uh, to get some rehab over at St. Catherine's, and so pray for uh, pray for her as she's going through this process of rehab and of getting stronger so that then she can go back home again. Uh, we're very glad that, that God has brought her through the issues and the struggles that she's had and, the, and all of the, the sickness seems to, be, uh, seems to be in the past, and we're so grateful uh, that God has heard and answered those prayers. Now continue to pray uh, for her continued uh, strengthening and for God to bring her to that place where she can go home again and, uh, and be uh, at home. There you go. Uh, I know that we have others in our church. I know that we've been praying for uh, for several. Um, 
Ann comes to mind, Ann, Ann Atkinson, I know I said Ann, but not, not this Ann, Ann Atkinson, has uh, been sick for, uh, again, for the last week, continuing to pray for Ann. Uh, it is, uh, of course, one of those things this time of year where it seems like everybody is coughing and hacking and sneezing. Uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you, if you're concerned that there's something that maybe it's more than allergies with you, feel free to stay home. Feel free to watch on, online. That's okay. Uh, the rest of us who, uh, who don't want to have to end up in the hospital appreciate that. We're, we're okay with that. Now, uh, in, in all seriousness, though, uh, thank you so much for all the ways that you continually uh, think about and care for the folks within our community uh, of, of faith, within our local church here. Thank you so much. Let's pray. Lord God, in all ways and in all things, may you be glorified. This is our prayer. This is the desire of our heart. These are not just words that we say. As Father, this morning, this is absolutely, we recognize the best thing that we could ask for, that you be glorified in all things. Father, we thank you for the ways that you have brought us through uh, whatever we faced this past week. Thank you, Lord God, that in you we have hope. In you, Lord God, there is peace. Yes, I know that, that this world brings its struggles. I know that we all go through every day and, and collect baggage along the way, words that were spoken to us, things that, that uh, perhaps we feel like we were slighted on, ways that, that, uh, uh, that we've been going through times of, uh, and issues and struggles in our own life, and, and the preacher never came to see me. Father, thank you that you are there. Thank you, Lord God, that your presence comforts and heals and strengthens. Thank you, Father, for all of the ways that you prove your love, that you continually demonstrate, Lord God, the ways that you are with us, calling us to be your people. Father, we are so grateful to you for the opportunity this morning to gather in this place to lift one another up in prayer. We've mentioned those, Father. We've mentioned Carolyn and Anne. We continue to pray for, for Fred, who I know has had a tough week and is struggling still with some things this morning. Continue to be with him as he goes through his cancer treatments with, uh, with Judy and, the, and the, the issues that she has uh, with, with pain and the things that she's dealing with, with, with her diagnosis continue to be with her, continue to be with Jim as he cares for her. Father, this is just the tip of the iceberg, we know. But what we also know, Lord God, is that no matter what it is that we face, no matter what it is that, that we're going through, Father, you are bigger than whatever that struggle is, and you are able, Lord God, to bring us through. Help us this morning to keep our eyes fixed upon you. Hear us now as we join our hearts and our voices together, praying as Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning from the New Testament comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul writes these words, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. And all the preachers said, Amen. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will... I've been entrusted with the stewardship. What is my reward then? That when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel of Christ without charge, that I may not abuse my authority in the gospel. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews to those who are under the law as under the law, that I might win those who were under the law to those who are without law as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who 
who are without law. To the weak, I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be a partaker of it with you. Let's stand. Let's sing together again. You might want to turn to number 568 in your hymnals, and let's sing together, May the Mind of Christ My Savior. Y'all know me. Many of you know this guy. We are grateful this morning for Jerry to be able to be here uh, to preach, to share with us what God has laid upon his heart. My prayer now is that God will give us open ears, ears to hear, hearts that are ready to move at the impulse of what God says to do. May God be glorified in all that God brings. just sang my prayer Lord forget the channel let them forget the channel and remember you amen we're just channels through which God works and uh, it is important to God that we know that the instrument that he's using is an earthly human instrument I don't like that part of it because he wants you to know how weak and pitiful that I am apart from him. He wants you to know that if there's anything good about what comes through any message, that it's him and not me. A few days ago, I, I wondered if I would be in good health for preaching today, and I'm so thankful that God has given me health and strength, uh, given me a good wife that gets on me and makes me take care of myself, and all of those things, but uh, a few days ago I thought, oh, it's going to be rough, but uh, God has answered our prayer, and if you hear some leftover, that's usually the last thing that gets better for me, is my voice tends to crack a little bit. If that happens, uh, hopefully it won't be the sound system, and maybe it won't be my voice, but I appreciate your prayers, because we are, I am keenly aware of how much I need him, and uh, hopefully all of you, when you come to church, you're praying. Before you come to church, you're praying. And uh, it's so important because God says you have not because you ask not. 
And you may not understand all the reasons behind that. I've delved into that. I think I understand some of that. But even if we don't understand, we take him at his word, don't we? You have not because you ask not. So there's some things we're going to have because we're asking. Not my will, but his. We want his will to be done in this service. I have such uh, admiration and confidence in your pastors here, and I appreciate them. I want you to know that. I love them and have great confidence in them because they love the Lord. I also have great confidence in this local church, and uh, we need you to do what needs to be done. And uh, I've always said that when my kids were at a very impressionable uh, stage, that I was thankful that we were here. Those years that I was the first Pastor Jerry, I'm thankful that my kids grew up in a very uh, important time in their life in this church because there is a special kind of family love that is here that is vital to God's cause. And it's been that way for a long time. And we appreciate it. So much we could talk about, but uh, we ask God to sanctify this time. Protect it. We all have things going on in our lives, don't we? But we're here to, to hear from his word. And so we pray that he will be with us and those who are having allergies and those who are coughing. Hosea 4, if you want to turn where we're going in scripture and also later John chapter 8. Sometimes Cindy points at her ear, you know, like, be louder or people can hear you. We are spoiled by amplification, aren't we? A good sound system, somebody told me, is one that if you're standing there preaching, it's almost like you're standing next to each person. And they're hearing you as if you're having a conversation with them. That's the ideal. That doesn't always happen, does it? We pray for that and hope for that. Hosea 4, beginning with verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out. Blood touches blood. Violence. Therefore shall the land mourn, and every one that dwelleth therein shall languish. The beasts of the field, the fowls of heaven, yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. Yet let no man strive nor reprove another, for thy people are as they that strive with the priest. Therefore shalt thou fall in the day, and the prophet also shall fall with thee in the night, and I will destroy thy mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Oftentimes some, the words of God, if they're misunderstood, can be taken in a very harsh way, but they're in a very loving way when he says, I'll forsake your mother, I'll forsake your children. Because God works through his word in our lives. And he says, if you're not about the word of God. If you're sinning against me and ignoring me, there are going to be all kinds of consequences. It's affecting the land. It's affecting everybody. There's violence. There's trouble everywhere, and sin has consequences, doesn't it? God has the answer. So often, uh, the prophets had the toughest job, didn't they? Too often, they were the, the relief picture, if you will. They were the ones coming in when things were falling apart, when things were not what they should be. And they had tough jobs, didn't they? Oftentimes when judgment was coming, uh, they were there hoping and praying and being an instrument of God for course correction. 
Hosea was a contemporary of Isaiah. We heard from the words of Isaiah, God's words through him earlier. You hear the same message in Isaiah 115. He says, when you spread forth your hands, and that's the idea of worship, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear you. Because your hands are full of blood, you're guilty before me. And then in Isaiah 116, wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Learn to do well. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, those stains that nobody can get out, I don't care what they use, though they be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be white as wool. They shall be as wool. So God has Hosea make this court filing in the first verse of Hosea 4. This controversy can be translated that God is making a charge against his people, like in a courtroom. This is my charge. A formal declaration of what's wrong. And it's very simple and it's very direct. In verse 1, the Lord brings this charge with the inhabitants of the land because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. What an indictment. And then there's a list of all of that that we just read, the list of evidence that he brings. There, it's not there because look what's happening. And then as always, uh, God does what he does. He lays the greatest blame on those who are the ones who are supposed to be leading in truth and mercy and knowledge of God. In verse 4, the New King James Version says, Now let no man contend or rebuke another, for your people are like those who contend with the priest. The people are a product of something is what he's saying. The New Living Translation, which isn't my favorite, but when it says, says it the way I like the way it says it, I'll use it. Don't point your finger at someone else and try to pass the blame. My complaint, you priests, is with you. And he was talking about the spiritual leadership, and we're talking about in, in general, in the pe among the people of God in that time. I'm laying the blame at you. And how many times in the church today do we point the finger at the vile, wicked world around us and God says, I'm pointing the finger at you. I'm pointing the finger at you because there's no truth in the land. And you're the ones that are responsible. We know what Jesus said to his disciples. He said, you're the salt of the earth. You are the one who preserves human society. You're the one that makes the difference. But if you lose that which makes you that, then you're good for nothing. There's no truth in the land. If there's no truth in the land, we know where the blame goes, don't we? And that is why when God sends judgment, he says, start at my house. Don't start in all those houses out there. In all those institutions that we could talk about and say how much corruption we see out there. He always says, start at my house. He's given us this amazing alternative to judgment. It's a learning, growing relationship with Jesus Christ. That requires that we accept him as Lord and we walk with him as Lord. It's, it's really pretty simple, isn't it? That's why Jesus said in Luke 14, 33, Whosoever he be that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. I hope we get that plain language. The Lord says if you don't stop making it about you and yours and start making it about me and mine, you can't be my disciple. God supernaturally imparts truth of God to those who come through faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. The Bible says the natural man can't know the things of, of God 
The spiritual man can know the things of God. It requires that we know him as Lord and, and truth is his responsibility. Not my responsibility. Mine is to come to him and say, Lord, I want to learn from you. I want to be taught of you. It's his responsibility. And it's the, the wondrous alternative to judgment. If you will let Jesus be the Lord of your life, if you'll let him be your teacher, if you'll let him be your guide. It's not about simple knowledge of facts and figures, is it? It's not about stats. It's having a heart-to-heart -heart with God. And he'll have one with you. I've often used the illustration. Cindy knows all the stats about me. She knows I graduated from college and where I went to high school and, and when I was born. And we could go on and on and on, right? Stats. But Cindy's my wife, and we've been in a love relationship for a long time. She knows something about my heart. And I know something about her heart. And that's the thing God is talking about, not learning scripture, but learning me, learning about me. And what God requires of us is to just be after him and see how I fit in, not after something for me. And so much of what's in church today has boiled down to what can you do for me instead of who is God and what he's doing. How that applies to me. What God requires of leadership is that we understand the process. And we are personally participating in that process. I don't claim by any stretch to have arrived. I don't set myself up as a standard. As Jerry was talking about in Sunday school today. We don't set ourselves up as a, the standard. He's the standard. Not me. But I need to be doing what I'm calling you to do. And that's the only way I could ever be a leader in the church, is if I'm doing it. It means something to me. Of course, the Bible says not a novice. That means not a beginner at it when you're talking about church leadership. Somebody that's been doing it. What God says to listen to me. Come to me. Trust me. When Jesus walked the earth, he had a deep compassion on the masses of people because their spiritual leaders had forsaken this precious process that is so simple. And this is something Jesus said in Matthew 9, 36. When he saw the multitudes, it says, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. It broke his heart that they fainted from a Greek word meaning they were weak and frail and vulnerable. He looked at them and said, they're so needy. Then he said unto his disciples around him, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the workers are few. He said, look at this hunger. Look at this need. It is so vast. We just need workers. We need those willing to do what God calls us to do. To sit at his feet and hear his message. Believe him, trust him. He does the application, doesn't he? And we believe him and trust him. Jesus longed for the, there to be those leading in that process for his uh, church leadership, church leadership in his day, to be doing what God calls us all to do, of growing and learning. He needed qualified workers who understood the process, engaged in the process. That's where we need to understand God's charge through Hosea, not only because there's no truth, nothing being established, nothing being truly learned, but nobody's living in it. Also, there's no mercy. No mercy. What is that? Loving kindness. And you could talk about loving kindness toward God, but you have to talk about loving kindness towards others. Loving kindness, pity. If we truly understand the process in Christ, then we are sympathetic like Jesus was of the masses 
who don't understand, who are without a shepherd. They need a shepherd. And we as those who are letting him be the shepherd of our souls, we see they need that too. I need it. I can't abandon it. I have to keep letting him lead my life. And that's what they need. And it works. That wondrous relationship and that power of his spirit, we can know him. We can know him. If we seek him with all of our heart, the Bible says, he's more important than anything else on this earth. Too many people are playing with it. Stop playing with it. He has to be the most important thing in your life. You don't have the responsibility of learning. You have the responsibility of surrendering to the master teacher. And there are those who take God's words out of context and they, they forsake knowing and they forsake truth. And I hear it all the time. For example, Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. And those are beautiful, inspired words. And I'm not... Uh, discounting those words, but we got to have them in context. It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. This is God talking. Neither your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And people stop there and they say, oh, God is somebody we can't even fathom. We can't even know. And they base it on that scripture point always seems to be we can't really understand we can just barely scratch the surface but what are the verses that lead into those Isaiah 55 verses 6 and 7 seek ye the Lord while he may be found seek him while he can be found call ye upon him while he is near while you have the opportunity to call upon him do it while you have the opportunity don't wait till it's too late. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his own way and the unrighteous man his own thoughts and let him return to the Lord. Return to the Lord and he will have mercy and he will be found. We will know him as he really is. What a great blessing to know him as he is changes everything doesn't it psalm 25 and verse 5 lead me in thy truth and teach me on thee do i wait all the day i can't do it on my own same thing we talked about in sunday school you can't just say well, i'm going to plow through scripture today learn about god no it has to be him involved I have to have him. Lord, lead me in your truth. Teach me. On thee do I wait. Help us, Lord. And when I ask you to pray before you get to church, that's part of what I'm asking for. That's what God is asking for, more importantly. Say, Lord, we know it takes you. We're waiting on you, Lord. We need you, Lord. This is what's missing from our world. God being made known. We can't do it on our own. We can't do it in our own strength. He says, come to me and learn of me. Do we believe him? I believe him. Do I have a lot to learn? Absolutely. But that's not my responsibility. I just sit at his feet. I let him be the master teacher. And Jesus called... Uh, the promised Holy Spirit, what did he call him at one point? The Spirit of Truth. In John 16, 13, Jesus said, When he, the Spirit of Truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. What a blessing that is. I don't have to do it. He will guide you into all truth if you will let him. And he doesn't care how much I have to go. He just cares if I'm letting him be my teacher, my guide in life, my God, my Lord. The Apostle Paul trying to get people to enter this process, this so important process of letting him be your teacher, your Lord, your guide. 
he had one of those Old Testament verses in mind in Isaiah 64, 4. Since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen. And Paul puts it in proper context, doesn't he? In 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 10, as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. How many times have you heard that verse? Make sure you hear the rest of it. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. We're not left groping in the darkness and hoping that somehow that we're on the right track. No, we can know that we're on the right track by the power of the Holy Spirit in a relationship with Jesus Christ. I can know. No, I, I can't claim I know it all. But what I do know has changed me and changed my life. Because he's my teacher, not because I'm good at it. Because he's good at it. The Spirit does it through this glorious process of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and those of you who have been around uh, the Bethel Methodist Church for a while, would you be patient with me just for a moment as I go to John chapter 8? There was a good uh, cornflake commercial a while back. I appreciated it. it. Said This guy on TV said, taste them again for the first time. That's good advice, isn't it? Maybe you had cornflakes a long time ago, but taste them again for the first time. I hope all of you go out and buy a box of cornflakes after <laughs> service. So I haven't had cornflakes in a while. But John chapter 8. Verse 31, and Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, this is so important, listen, if you continue in my word, my word, my teaching, if you will continue in my word, then you are my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth's going to do everything it needs to be done. You don't have to do it. All you have to do is continue in his word. Continue with him as your teacher. I don't have to get it done. He does it. Did y'all notice there's one if there? And two shalls. Now, I don't know if the King James Version's up here, but that's exactly what the King James says. If, if you continue in my word. Then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know. That's an absolute. If you continue in his word, you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. And they didn't know what he was talking about because they said, we've never been slaves. And he says, yes, those who are committing sin are slaves to sin. I'm talking about a freedom from sinning against God. Because you know me. You know me because you know me the son does it in this process called relationship which for you to be with God forever it's not optional I want to make sure you hear it uh, Jesus in verse 34 answered them verily verily I say unto you whoever is committing sin is the servant of sin and the servant uh, is not abiding in the house forever but the son abideth forever the Son, therefore, shall make you free. You shall be free indeed. Did you hear? If the Son makes you free, if Jesus makes you free, you will be free indeed. You don't have to do it. He does it. All you have to do is let him by truth and faith. Let him. He does it. If the Son does it, you'll be free indeed. And you'll abide in the Father's house forever. The Son does it in this process called relationship, which for you to be with God forever, it's, it's not an optional process. It's something that we have to be engaged in. Seek him now while you have opportunity. That's why part of God's charge in Hosea 4 was there is no mercy. In mercy, there's tenderness towards God. But as I said earlier, it's also outward towards others. 
kindness, patience, pity. Because we don't have to do it, we can't do it. He has to do it. It's why leaders must be in the process because they understand it. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love understands the process. Love was shown to that mighty preacher, Apollos, wasn't it? In Acts 18 and verse 24, where he is described as an eloquent man. Mighty in the scriptures, the Bible says. Being instructed in the way of the Lord, he was fervent in the spirit and spoke and taught diligently. But when these two Christians heard uh, and they perceived that he only knew about John's baptism, uh, they had not heard about the Holy Spirit. He had not. They took him unto them, took him unto them and expounded the way of God more perfectly or more completely. I love that picture. I know it was a transitional period of time. I know it was a different time than what we're talking about. Just the attitude is what I want to talk about. Here's a mighty powerful preacher in the Word. and they, Well, they, he doesn't understand this. What did they do? They took him unto themselves and expounded the word of God more clearly. In that mercy, that's patience, that's love, that's kindness. Ephesians 4 talks about walking worthy of this vocation, of this calling. What does it say? With all lowliness and meekness, with patience, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit, the unity of this process, leading us Closer and closer to the unity of the faith. Listen, this is important, I believe. Some want to abandon truth in the name of love. That's the wrong love, isn't it? We can't do that. But others want to abandon love in the name of truth. We can't do that, can we? But Ephesians 4.15 says it, doesn't it? Speaking the truth in love. We may grow up into him in all things. Speaking the truth in love. If we had all day, we could talk more about all of this. In 1 Corinthians 8. God, through the Apostle Paul, warns that through your knowledge you can destroy somebody. The context is they understood, oh, we're free to eat whatever meats we want to under, under grace. We're not under the ordinances of the law anymore. He said, but if in your freedom you make someone think it's okay to be in a pagan idol worship, your knowledge is destroying people. And so we know what kind of knowledge God's talking about. The kind that understands the process of mercy and kindness that he's shown me. And that he's still showing me. Because I've let him be my teacher. And he has to do it, I don't. He welcomes, we welcome people into this process, don't we, of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. There's something I love and I'm going to quit. I don't ever know when to quit. Except when Cindy looks cross-eyed maybe or something like that. There were three crosses. Y'all know about three crosses. The one in the middle was the most important. Because Jesus was dying for our sins so that he could have mercy on us. Y'all know two of the gospels say that two thieves on each side were mocking Jesus. You know what they were saying? If you're who you claim to be, get us out of this mess. I'm just paraphrasing. If, you, if, you claim, if you're who you claim to be, you've worked all these miracles, you've done all these wonderful things, get us down from this cross. Save us. And that's where all of us are as humanity, isn't it? If you're the God of love that you claim to be, get us out of it. Why are you letting this happen to me? 
Something happened in one of those thieves' lives, in his life, didn't it? He stopped making fun of Jesus. He started defending him. He said, we deserve this, but he doesn't. You know what he said, Lord? Remember me when you come into your kingdom. You know what happened that day? He said, it's not about me. It's about you and your kingdom. It's about you. Just help me to be a part of it, Lord. I just want to be a part of it. You know, it doesn't matter. There's no time. We don't have to do it. We just have to say, I'm in it, Lord, by faith. You know what he said? This day you'll be with me in paradise. I love those words. Because he was in it for him and not for himself, for the Lord and not himself. Is that what we're in it for? I pray, ask God to minister to us himself and help us to be instruments and in letting other people know about it. I don't know if you have a song planned. We do? Good. We're going to sing. I hope we're standing because we probably need to stand, don't we? Please do stand with us and turn to number 139 in your hymnals and we'll sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Let's pray. Father, we began this morning by speaking of your faithfulness. And again, Father, you have demonstrated through the preaching of your word, 
through the reading of scripture, through all the things that we have done here this morning, you've demonstrated that it's not about us, but it's always about you. Father, we give ourselves to you fully, completely. Lord God, if there's any part of us that we're holding back, if there's any part of us that desires my will and not your will, Lord, point that out. Let us see, Lord God, if there's any idol that we've built up in our life that we are trusting more than we're trusting you. And if so, then, Father, drive us to our knees that we might surrender fully to you and be made fully yours. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the message, for the messenger. And thank you, Lord God, for all the ways that you speak your truth in love. Bless this food that we're about to eat. Use it to nourish us, strengthen us, Lord God, that we might give that strength back to you. And with that strength, Lord God, may you use us as witnesses. In Jesus' name. Make me a servant as we go today. Make me a servant, humble and meek. Lord, let me lift up those who are weak. And may the prayer of my heart always be. Make me a servant. dismissed.